a dwarf on a giant's shoulders, sees farther of the two. The red engine comes racing up, its sirens screaming, skidding to a halt before the old house. The men come tumbling out of it in their uniforms and fire gear. A woman stands outside, crying, judging. The men rush past her, up the stairs into the attic. The attic door swings open, and books come tumbling out. For a moment, a book falls, open, into his hands. Time has fallen asleep in the afternoon sunshine. <laughs> he drops the book in fear and disgust. They open up their hoses, kerosene, not water. The book's pages crinkle with the moisture, and the men back out of the home. It's time for their last act, but the woman was not supposed to be there. The police were supposed to pick her up long ago. Still, she stands there. The captain yells for her to move, starts counting to ten. They can't do their job until she leaves. They're firemen, after all. The captain is halfway through his count. Then it happens. The woman holds up one singular, slender match. Play the man, Master Ridley. We shall this day light such a candle, by God's grace in England, as I trust shall never be put out. That previous scene is perhaps the most pivotal in Ray Bradbury's masterpiece, Fahrenheit 451, because it begins the protagonist's long journey to answer the question, might these books, these fragile things that every night they burn, be worth protecting, even at the cost of life itself? On the broadest level, this is the story of Guy Montag, a fireman in a society where books are banned. Here, only comics, cheap interactive TV, and pornography is allowed. Whenever books are found, the firemen are called to burn the books and whatever place was hiding them to the ground. Early on, Montag is fine with this. He sees it as a good and honorable job, and he's bought into society's propaganda that books warp the mind and break down the social order. But over time, he secretly begins to keep some of the books he was supposed to burn. Curious as to why people would risk so much for a stack of paper, he begins reading them. And at last, he rebels against the society he's in, fleeing his city and meeting others like him, who after a one-day atomic war that decimates the unreading, unthinking world that he came from, begin to rebuild society once more. But as Bradbury himself acknowledged, this book is about many things. In his younger days, just coming out of the McCarthy era, he said the book was about censorship and book burning. However, later in his life, he said it was about the dangers of easy entertainment. So let's take both of those viewpoints and break them down a bit. The book itself is an abundantly clear condemnation of book burning and censorship. But what's most interesting is Bradbury's own commentary on it. Because even though he'd lived through the McCarthy era and the Red Scare, he said that censorship came from us. That the government couldn't censor things, at least not for long, if we as a populace didn't want them to. More than that, though, he made an impassioned argument for being careful about how we censor. He said that if every group got to pull out of books everything that offended them, or that they just didn't like, we'd soon be left with just empty covers. He also made a somewhat naive argument that if groups didn't like what a book said, rather than censor those books, they should just write their own. Of course, he really didn't take into account the fact that some groups may face more obstacles than others when it comes to things like getting books into mass distribution, or that ideologies like fascism and McCarthyism, both of which he despised, came from people publishing unchecked things which advocated the silencing of others. But his fundamental point was still worthwhile. Without us embracing the book burning of the Nazis or the bonfire of the vanities, without us welcoming the historical revisionism that rewrites textbooks around the world, Without us asking the government, albeit not explicitly, to censor the things we don't want to believe or find objectionable, censorship on a broad scale is impossible to sustain. And it's not only governments. Before this type of censorship even hits the government level, we do it to ourselves on smaller levels. Fahrenheit 451 itself was censored by the publisher in 75 places over the years, without the author's consent, because concerned parents wrote in about the swear words or depictions of drunkenness. But then there's that other point that Bradbury wanted to make, the point about easy-to-consume media slowly dumbing down what we consume until all we consume is nothing of worth. And on this, he's both heinously wrong and absolutely right. Because ease of consumption isn't the problem. 
It's the content, the dumbing down for ease of consumption, which in the end may take away something from us all. And it's funny because this idea came to him as he saw a woman walking with a handheld radio one day. She was oblivious to the world around her as she was so wrapped up in whatever she was listening to. Bradbury thought of her like a zombie, tuned out from the world and tuned in to an easy escape. Imagine how horrified he'd be by our smartphones. Whoo! But the problem here is that he didn't know what she was listening to. She could have been listening to the Royal Shakespeare Company doing a rendition of Hamlet or Macbeth. And this is the problem with everyone who judges things by the medium they're rendered in rather than the quality of the work. Over the 20th century, we've learned how to make media much easier to consume. We've come to a better understanding of the human psyche and created new techniques for keeping us engaged. And in general, comic books, television, and video games today are way easier to consume than, say, picking up Milton. But that doesn't mean that they're inherently less worthwhile. And in each of those previously listed forms of media, you can find works as impactful as Paradise Lost. And for James personally, Paradise Lost was a tour de force that changed how he thought about a lot of things. And yet, that statement holds true. The danger we have to avoid is simply being lazy in what we produce and what we consume. Because there are games and comics that challenge us and make us rethink our perceptions. And there's anime and TV that forces us to watch intently and to analyze, deconstruct, and dissect what we're viewing. Bradbury's fear is that we'll choose what requires the least of us, and that companies will cater to that desire. But that's not a problem with the mediums we choose or develop themselves. That's a problem with us. To avoid the dangerously vapid dystopia Bradbury presents us, we don't have to abandon new media. We simply have to look for the things that challenge us in all of the mediums we consume.